today, uh, we're pleased and honored to have our friend Dudu Razon with us, a good friend of our rabbi. Um, and Dudu asked me this week if he could share something on Lechotran, we'd be uh, blessed and honored to have him do so. Dudu, you just have to unmute yourself. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Um, the Parashat Lech Lecha um, is uh, significant. It's significant for me, not only as a Jew, but as an Israeli, and I'll explain why. Moreover, it's very personal to me because of the year I was born in. Um, I will not make duplications to what uh, the Rabbi Shemi said, but uh, one thing which is very, very significant and uh, carries over the generations to us about Abraham. <clears throat> Sorry, being Haivri, the Hebrew, um, ever Ein Betresh in Hebrew is side, in French, Kote. So um, we have to remember that uh, Abraham was born in, uh, in a time of uh, idolatry. Uh, Terah, his father, had a successful business, actually, of idols and, uh, and icons and uh, statues and stuff, which he objected. And uh, in the Midrashim, they uh, describe how he basically broke, uh, um, he destroyed Terah's uh, business, let's call it this way. And he was against it, and his biggest rival at that time was Nimrod. Uh, Nimrod was uh, very much against Abraham. Actually, he tried to uh, uh, to hurt him. This was part of the stories between Nimrod and Abraham, and there is a very significant difference between them. Um, when Abraham was promised to have a name, like a great name, Nimrod also was looking for name by building cities, Babel, towers, uh, buildings. And when we look at Abraham as a nomad, everywhere that he came in, every transition point, every connection point in his way to Egypt, he built a tent and an altar and called the name of God and continued on. He did not build a city, he did not build buildings um, in order to leave monuments for his name or whatever. But from Shechem, by the way, Shechem uh, in Arabic called Nablus is the city that I fought in 1967. Mm -hmm. This is the city which is lying uh, just in the valley on one side, Eval, the mountain Eval, and on the other side, Mount Grizim, the Mount of Curse and the Mount of Blessing. So he came to Shechem, which I can tell you this is right at the center of Israel of today, and from there he continued Easter, and he went to uh, to the Eye, uh, and over there uh, we are actually going closer to Jerusalem, and then he navigated south towards Egypt, and then crosses uh, crosses uh, towards uh, the desert uh, because. Uh, because of the famine that was in. So um, um, the, the rabbi mentioned why God uh, chose Abraham to be the father. Yes, timeline, as far as the number 10 is concerned, this is a perfect number. And uh, if we look at Lech Lecha, uh, by gematria, which is translating or converting the letters into numbers, lech lecha makes a hundred. Lech is 30, kaf is 20, it's 50 and 50. So some of the Midrashim say that if we look at the final promise to Abraham, when he was age 100, had Isaac, which is the first generation actually 
of uh, the promise to Abraham. Because when he was 99, Hagar and Sarah was pregnant. And when he was 100, he had a son. So they say Lech Lecha starts with 100. And that's uh, part of those numbers. And he was chosen only because he was different. He was against the world of that day. Like uh, the rabbi mentioned, ever he was on the other side of that world that uh, was there. Now we have to remember the adultery of those days, the people, all they knew, they cultivated the land, they knew the land, they knew the skies, they knew earth, they knew stars, they knew the moon and the sun. So by uh, induction, looking around him, Abraham came to the conclusion that the sun rises on one side, sets on the other side, the moon goes here, comes there. The land is not growing if there is no rain, the rain does not come if there are no clouds. So it must be that there is something above all of them. None of those things could stay by itself and control the world. There must be something that rules, governs everything. And from then on, uh, his idea was that there is an almighty power that moves everything, which was against all ideas of the people that built statues and icons and um, uh, made of clay or whatever it is. So uh, uh, the wise men also tried to find out at what age Abraham uh, what age Abraham started to have all those revelations. And there are many, uh, not many, there are three theories. One of them say that while he was three years old and they make a calculation by the timeline, uh, three years old, uh, the most acceptable one is that uh, that happened in age 40, which is Gil, what we call Gil Bina, when you start to understand where your understanding comes to you. And also makes sense because he had the time to actually expose his rebellious uh, ideas between being young uh, until 40, especially that Nimrod was after his, excuse me, after his back. So another thing which is interesting about Abraham, and you could say coincidence or not, but believe it or not, Abraham was born in 1948 BCE, before Common Era. And he was promised the land of Israel at that year or later on. But he was born 1948 BCE. The state of Israel had been founded in 1948. So I would claim that with all some uh, controversy about the behavior of Abraham that could be justified by being a father, and I'll explain it, um, he, he, he actually is the identity, our identity of religion and state. Because if we're coming to the circumcision of Abraham, which is the sign, the proof of the covenant with God, the breed, that and all, of course, the males in his, in his household, and then later on, uh, all the generations of males later on, uh, that's the establishment of Jews. He was the first Jew, because until then they were all Israelites. Oh, so on religion side, he is the one that actually put the stamp on Judaism, on the sign which is the most and and the most the most visible, invisible, but because we don't show it, but the most visible. And on the other side, his date of birth, the year of his birth, 1948 BCE. And 1948, um, uh, uh, 98, 1948, the state, of, the declaration of the state of Israel. We could say, oh wow, uh, only coincidence. 
but to me, especially that I was born in that year, that, uh, that makes a significant of Lech Lecha. Um, another, thing, another thing about uh, Abraham, he was definitely a revolutionist because of his new ideas. He had to fight against all those that believed differently. And we all know that when you believe in something, it's not so easy to impose it or to, uh, to teach it and uh, everybody accepts it. He was a revolutionist. And basically, and we have to read when they say, they say the God of Abraham. Now, uh, when Elohe Abraham, we, when we read, when we read the Tfilot, we say Elohe Abraham, it's Chag Yaakov. Now it's the same, a same God for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but it is Elohe Abraham. This is the God of Abraham. This is not the God of others. Now, if we look at the big three faith today, they all are monotheists. They all believe that there is one powerful God but it's not Elohe Avraham. So everywhere that we read about it, Elohe Avraham, Elohe Yitzchak, Elohe Yaakov, this is the God of Abraham. And I would claim that he was not only giving the identity of, uh, of state, not only of religion, but also of monotheism. Because until then, they believed in many, many, uh, many, many gods. They were, they were worshiping the sun, they were worshiping the moon, uh, the, the prosperity, the, 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 the fish, the sea. So here comes somebody who says, Eloi Abraham. Oh, this is a different one. This is somebody you don't see. This is different. So I would claim that uh, the significance of Lech Lecha is, uh, is those things, the identity of religion, the identity of state later on, and the revolution of monotheism, which was unknown until then. Now there is only a, a fault, and, and the rabbis are actually mentioning it, and they're trying to explain that, uh, yes, he had a fault when he comes to the Egyptians and he says what he says about uh, Sarah and, uh, and him being uh, being uh, siblings, but they say this is this is this is a, a, a normal and a common father. There is no father, and later on, by the way, when when he uh, listens to Hagar, haven't we heard before about a man listening to a woman doing something and then saying, "Oh, she told me. Oh, I did it because she said." <laughs> We know about it. And that was the first man that actually God revealed to him also. But that's a common person. This is a human being. This is Adam. This is Ben Adam. He is a father. He listened to his wife. And he made a mistake. Yes, he made an error. Yes. In Egypt, yes, father. But later on, he redeems himself through all kinds of other things that he does in order to uh, uh, how to say, how to overcome his, uh, and yes, he is not a perfect man, but he is, he is Abraham, he is a father. A father is not, is not complete, is not, uh, uh, is not whole, but he is doing his best in order to keep his family. And where we see it, that he still keeps his family as family. When he goes and he takes just few people and goes to save Lot. He goes to fight, he puts his life on stake. And he goes war against four kings. Now we have to think, uh, you're taking 600,000 people and he had less according to the Bible. And he goes to fight kings that have army, that have strategies, that are settled in the country, and only for what? Only because Lot is captive, and he goes to save him. And when he saves him, uh, 
he basically kind of justifies the fact that he is a family man. And this is not a brother, this is a nephew, son of a son of a brother. So the rabbis do justify uh, his actions and yes, he, uh, he actually had characteristics of a father. So this is, uh, this is something that we, uh, now one of the things that, uh, and with that I will basically finish because I don't want to make duplication, uh, duplicating on the rabbi. Uh, you see, we, we look into a conflict that we have today with Arabs. I don't wanna say Palestinians, but I will say Arabs, the Arab countries, because if they are our cousins, and basically they are our cousins, they are sons of Ishmael. Now, they are cousins, they are our family, and yet there is such a big, big feud, such a big uh, depth uh, of, of, of I, I don't know how to say that, how big tear between, between us to the point of hatred somewhere when we are family. Well, if we look at what happened to Ishmael and uh, Isaac, and, and by the way, by, by a, any family logic, the big, uh, the big higher, higher after a father dies, or the one that actually controls the inheritance, the one that takes care of it, is the bigger son, the older son which is Ishmael. And here God did not give to Ishmael. It was given to Isaac. And Isaac was second to. And Ishmael was basically sent away with a promise, yes, with revelation to Hagar, and you will become a big nation and there are bigger nations than we are. Actually, we surround us, all sons of Hagar and Ishmael. And I say, we today in 2020 still suffer from, it's a PTSD of, of the fight, the quarrel, the feud, and there is nothing like a family feud. Because once there is something there in the family, it's so very difficult to come and have somebody to moderate in a family feud. And yes, I would say that even with kind of a inferiority complex, quote unquote, of Ishmael at the time being discriminated, basically, uh, that carries through generations. And I'm sure that through the beliefs and uh, whatever were instilled in the people, and on one side, you see sons of Jacob and Isaac and prosperity and, and, and tribes and organization and country, though small, but very organized and tribes. And even though Egypt is much more prosperous than Israel, and we see it twice when, when, when uh, now they're going, because of the feminine in Israel, they're going to Israel, uh, to Egypt. Egypt, the, the area of the Nile over there is much more prosperous than the dry Israel with Samaria and the mountains. So there is a jealousy too between, between sons of Ishmael. And, and I, I say that that is carried through generations to today. And until somehow this is settled, set, or the people will come to terms with that, with that uh, discrimination, quote unquote, I don't think that will settle. And this is deep in us. And uh, so many times, friends of mine, Arabs, you know, when they want to really make uh, to me what we call chendalach, uh, they say, hey, cousin, how are you? And I'm, uh, I, I am their cousin by history, but I, I don't feel their cousin. And, and this is bad. And until the day will come 
and somebody will stay in front of the screen like I do now and will say, oh, today I got a call from a friend, an Arab friend, and he called me cousin, and I'm so proud of it, it will not be settled. And Lech Lecha is a big, big uh, word in Hebrew. By the way, I'll go back to the Hebrew. Lech Lecha, as far as the grammar is concerned, is a very, very, uh, very, very simple command which says nothing. Because if I say, Peggy, go out. So I show you a direction. Peggy, go home. I tell you where. If I say, Lech Lecha, it's like in Arabic saying, Ruh. It's just, just go, go. Lech Lecha has another, another meaning, biggest meaning. And I think this is the spiritual journey that Abraham had to take while living because he tells him, Lech Lecha, you go into yourself, you take a spiritual journey, see who you are, have all the checks to see that you have all the morals and all the forces and everything, and starts by going out of your, first of all, your country, because this is not, it's a bad neighborhood for you. Leave it. It's not, you are, you are at the wrong block. Then, Tazovet Arzecha, your country, Moladetcha, the place that you were born in, and the house of your father, which means your family surroundings. And go into a spiritual journey. And I think this is the significance of the parasha. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, Dudu. Many of us have done that. I've left the things that we've known, uh, left our families to go on a spiritual journey. I know I have. So I really relate to everything that you're saying. But can you imagine uh, uh, Abraham coming to Sarah and they are already older Right. When she's already settled and it's good and there is a lot of fun around and everything and coming to her and say, hey, you know what? Let's leave everything and go to a place where? He says, I don't know where. We let's go. But where? <laughs> and, and she has to leave everything and believe her husband that that's what they're going to do. Yeah. You know, so she basically uh, obeys the, the husband that she has and she leaves. When she was very comfortable where she was. And I know. She's at the age of retirement, 65. Exactly. Yeah. You know? exactly. We're settling down. And he said, nope, no settling down. No Get settling out. down. Yeah. Well, she had a few times she had uh, both of them had to believe things that were were said to them. Like if somebody comes to me today to my wife, you know, in the supermarket and tells her, listen, don't tell anybody that I talk to you, but nine months from today, you're gonna be pregnant. She'd laugh. To Yafi. Yeah. Um, you know what? It takes a lot to believe, even if you think that he is a messenger from God, because mm -hmm. Sarah was already in the age that basically the, the, the female body does not have that if you like it or not. And you have still to believe that, yes, it was, yes. And he had doubts and he yeah. put doubts. But right. at the end, you know, it was proven He's, that, uh, and that's the God of Abraham. Exactly. We, we see he, he doesn't work in a vacuum. He did that before. Exactly. Last week we heard about Noah. Noah lived at a time when there was no rain. He lived yeah. up on a mountain and he's told to build a big boat. Yeah, that's uh... and and all the animals start coming to him. I mean, he and he believed, you know, and he did it. That's this. That's the bitachon is that he heard and then he did. Yeah, and that's our our journey is that we hear, we have to trust and we have to move forward. That I think was also Rabbi Shemi's message to us in this community because we're in a big state of of change. Yes, and we don't know what's coming. Uh, sometimes I lay, I lay up like last night again till three in the morning, thinking, talking to myself, looking at where the fears are, 
looking at what's, you know, what's coming and we don't know. Um, I was thinking about Rabbi Percy last night and I was thinking about his life and how he, he did exactly that. He left his home and everything he knew to go to a strange land. And he, he lived a lot more than 70 years. When he was three years old, he had already, was already reading books. By the, when he was 14, he was in the same class as university students. He started university at 14. When most people were just graduating, he had already two degrees and was teaching thermodynamics. He traveled all over the world. He worked as in, in secret service. He's worked in so many things. He's read so many things. So he lived a long, long life. He didn't live till 70. He probably lived till 120. And, and he faced a lot of challenges. And he's leaving us with a lot of challenges. And that's why for us, this message is so important. Um, because if God walked in the garden with Adam and Eve, and he walked with Abraham, he walked with Noah, he'll walk with us. And we need to remember that in the days ahead because it's not always easy to face what we have to face. Well, another thing is that uh, I think we should adopt another thing that Abraham did. And maybe it's just symbolic on the way, on the path of hardship. When you go and you journey to a place you don't know where, and you come to a place where you kind of not yet rest, but you put a tent, put an altar, build an altar, pray God, thanks God, and continue on to the next point. And through this hardship from altar to altar, from place to place, and through famine to Egypt to hardship, at the end, you come to a place where you can sit comfortably. And I think what, what people going through hardship should do is basically on the way, put uh, step stones, you call it, and, and just build an altar. Uh, just symbolically, I'm saying build an altar, but praise God that I'm, I did so far. There is another 300 miles to go, but thanks God for the first 100 miles. So I think this is something else which is very emphasized because every time they say he came to Shechem and he built an altar and he called the name of God. He came to the eye, he built an altar and he prayed the name of God. And he never just put a monument and say, here arrived Mr. Abraham, blah, 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 to live a you just continue. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mauricio, you always have something interesting to say. No, it is. Oh, you're stuck. He's mute. No, no, he's stuck. Sometimes oh. his, his um, Wi-Fi. Okay, while we're waiting for Mauricio to come back, does anyone? It's very interesting what you're saying. Um, and besides of, do you hear me? No, I do. You were stuck for yeah, a, minute, a minute. Okay, okay, sorry. No, I was saying that, uh, as David was saying, that um, it's very interesting that when when Abraham goes to a place, he built an altar, but uh, I, I, I just imagine, because this is my imagination, it's not road, right? But uh, people, I guess, they just go around to see what Abraham was doing. <laughs> so uh, in that sense, the, the Bible says that God invoked God. And, and some rabbi says that, that he announces that there is one God because is you know, it, it's when we do something, uh, people just, come to us and for example last year uh, we put uh, the the hanukkah out of the of the, of a window and I start to to ask what is that so in that sense 
to me is the same idea what Abraham did, right? Yeah, he was uh, and, and, and so, uh, and so, but that, and also they say that Melchizedek is very interesting person, a person in this parasha that probably he met Abraham in Shechem. And then when he came back, this guy started to, to announce there is only one God, but, but he learned from Abraham. So uh, to me, it's very important that uh, when, when we find a, a treasure, uh, when we find the Torah, when we find the, the way to live, we, we need to, 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 to proclaim also. And that doesn't mean to be proselyting, but uh, that means to be a, a living Torah, as Rabbi Percy said. People will see you and, and they say, they, they, will see, they, they will see something different in you. So you have to answer sometimes. So, um, and to me, in the way of your behavior, they will see something different. And, and so in that way, you are invoking God to that place. And, and, and you become a, 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 a blessing to, to the people. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know, but it, it's something, for example, if we go to a place for, with my wife, we, we always say, uh, I don't know, we enter to a place and, and it's alone, the, the place. We enter and start to come a lot of persons. And, and we say, Oh, is when 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 we go to a different places, we can see how God bless the places. So it, it's a promise. It's in a promise. We are a blessing. So our behavior has to be to be a blessing too. We have to behave in order in in our words in in in, 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 in the way we we accept people in the way we we proclaim and we in, in the way we think we, we need to be also a light as as Abraham was and also I, I was hearing this week a uh, uh, a midrash from a, a rabbi saying that also Ur is very interesting word which means um, it's like a caldera in Spanish but I don't know how to say that in English Feel. what does it mean caldera uh, like a pen, um, um, a bucket. Uh. Yeah, it's a bucket of fire. Yes. You make the brick. Yes. Uh, oh, like a cauldron. Yeah, cauldron, cauldron. Yeah. So Abraham was in the fire, and that's yeah. why they say that uh, that it, it, they relate the midrash with the fire in the experience that he was put in a in this. Uh, Calgary uh, oh, right. inside with fire and, and God saved Abraham. So it's very interesting. And they describe how Haran died. Haran tried, he, he saw his brother in the fire protected by God. So he tried to enter there, but he was not called and then he died. Uh, but it is very interesting. And the uh, calorie is on the other side of the river. So that's why God tell, tells you, go, go to the other side of the river. OK. Uh, Peggy, another thing uh, that was mentioned by Rabbi Shemi, um, at the, with the same logic of uh, where it says there, uh, El Shaddai, um, the interpretation of uh, Shemi, of Rabbi Shemi is uh, very much acceptable uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Judaism, um, at least uh, as it is uh, taught in uh, synagogues in, uh, in Israel, Shaddai is Shin Daled Yud, and it is Shomer Daltot Israel, the protector of the doors of Israel. And it's put on every mezuzah, as you know, the Shaddai. 
This is Shomer, Shomer, which is protector, Daltot, Israel, and it comes at the same time that God promises him that not only that he will protect him, but anybody, um, that anybody that uh, try to hurt him, he will curse him, or your cursors will be cursed. Another thing that's uh, informative, um, all our uh, three patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, were born in the month of Nisan and died in Nisan. So it's very, very interesting. And again, we cannot, we cannot again claim, oh, it's only a coincidence, but three patriarchs, Abraham, it's, it's acceptable that he was born on, I think, 17 Nisan, uh, Isaac and Jacob. The three of them in the month of Nisan. And, uh, Is that in Torah or those are the Midrashim? The Midrashim. Okay. Yeah. Well, I don't know if Midrashim or Talmud is talking Talmud. about. It. Talmud, I think. Talmud. Right. Uh, yeah, because Talmud is talking about the age of Abraham also. Right. Like, uh, uh, so, so the Talmud is talking about, uh, about Nisan, the month of the three patriarchs. Mm -hmm. The other thing that you mentioned was that everywhere he went, he built an altar, which is very typical also of paganism because there's, they have little altars everywhere, which is eventually why God said, you're no longer to build altars wherever you want. You are gonna build just one, it with the Mishkan and then later the temple. And um, it, it, it reminded me of how he was gonna slowly wean us away from the pagan altars to point to an altar that points to the to the only God, to the living God. But the yeah, but but you see, if if it was uh, any building, any build there an altar, and by that the sentence ended, I'll accept that it is part of. But it always say he built an altar and called the name of God. Exactly, he was changing the direction. Exactly, and yeah. he was showing the people around him of the God of Abraham. He, was, he wasn't calling just God, he was calling the name of his God right. and called the name of God. Right. So it's interesting that he builds an altar and calls the name of God. So this is, uh, this is significant to him, there's no question. And it needs to be significant to us too because yeah. we can call the name of God every day, every moment we when whether we need him or not call oh, him. my wife every 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 time that i do something she says oh my god <laughs> she means me but at home she can call me david <laughs> does anybody else have anything they'd like to add uh, so, um also there, there is a, a number very interesting um uh, there is Eliezer or Eliazar in Spanish, right? Yes. That is my help. So he's, he said that Abraham uh, was going to, to a war with four kings. And the Torah is describing uh, about the, the, the night kings and how this, this one of these kings, um, this, I don't know how to say that, but it, it was fighting against and he conquered the Rephim who were supposedly uh, giants, right? So, which means is that it, it was not a, a, a king of, I don't know, 300 people. <laughs> they, 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 it's something that they want to express that it was a very um, powerful kings, right? So, and says in the in the fourteen, I guess it says that Abraham went to 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 fight against those kings, and he defeated them. Uh, but it says between that he took three hundred and eighteen persons, which is the number of Eliezer. In Gematria, Eliezer oh. comes. 318. So it's very interesting because it's like saying in, in a hidden way that that Abraham 
not just go with people, but go with the help of the Almighty. So it's very impor important to go out to fight you know, with the help of God. Exactly. And if I listen to some, if you hear some of the stories that Dudu tells us about the early days of Israel, and uh -huh. even before you, uh, about the beginning, how we were so small in number, fighting against so many kings around us. You've seen that firsthand, Dudu. Yeah, well, listen, uh, Abraham, in this case, uh, when he heard that Lot is captive, he took 318, 318 people. Um, in an army scale, it does not make even a, a battalion, you know, mm -hmm. one battalion, it doesn't make it. So with 318 to go against four kings, yeah. Well, how many went against, you were surrounded in the Yom Kippur War. How many did you go against in the well, Six-Day War? In the Six-Days War, um, in the Six-Days War, we even had a situation where somewhere we had an upper hand because of surprise. Not by numbers, of course. Right. But when, when, you see, when you see in Yom Kippur, when three tanks that are on Golan Heights are against uh, 120, 125 tanks and destroying them, and out of that only one tank survived, Amazing. you really question. I mean, okay, the, the drivers of the tanks are very skilled. Uh, the commanders are really good. But really, 120 against three in all the, the books about the wars of the world, uh, including Roman, um, it, it was not heard that uh, you could actually withstand, you could stay, you can uh, deflect with three tanks, 120. It's, it's almost impossible. And, only lately, uh, in one of the, the television series that I see from Israel, which is very, very new, uh, they made, in this October, they made a, a series called She'at Neila, the She'at Neila. Like, like in Yom Kippur, when you do Neila, the, close, the closing of the, they call it She'at Neila, and it's about the Yom Kippur war. And there are, and there are documentaries of course, it's, a, it's more a series movie, but there are documentaries from what happened in Hermon, what happened in Golan Heights, what happened in other places where, uh, where the numbers are, like we see here, four kings against 318 people. So yeah, I've seen that. In other words, if anybody will tell me that's a miracle, uh, what happened to Abraham is a miracle? Maybe, no, it's not because I, I face situations like that. It's not a miracle. But if we do believe that there is something that actually controls, governs, rules, maybe it was there. I don't know. But uh, three tanks, you have to understand, three tanks is 12 people, okay? That's what it is, 12 people. 120 tanks, is uh, 400 and something uh, with ammunition, with, uh, with missiles, with uh, everything. That's what it is. So, yeah. But they didn't have the God of Avram. Well, one of, one of them, the commander of this uh, unit, later on he got the award for bravery and uh, it's the topest award. Uh, oh, Nahalani? Kahalani. Kahalani, Kahalani. Yeah. Kahalani. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it can happen. Yeah, I've, I've loved listening to those stories. One tank, he would be all over the place and he thought there were so many. He shoots here four of them, goes backwards, goes to the other side, shoots some other. And... Uh, Love it. But you also have to have a sense of mission. It's not enough to be skilled with, uh, with a cannon and with the drivers and everything. If you don't have in your mind the sense of mission, yeah. 
the fact that you are you have a goal, a target, and you are determined, uh, that will not happen. Because if you feel, oh my God, what, what am I going to do here? Then you run away. You don't stand. But if you know that if you run away, uh, those tanks are going to be uh, at the Jordan River by Tiberias, yeah. and some of these people will rape your friends, uh, you do that. Yeah, it's life and death. Yeah. 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 So this was wonderful today. Anybody have anything else to add before we say goodbye? Thank you so much, Dudu. Thank you, Mauricio. Shabbat to you. Shabbat okay. shalom to everybody. Thank you. We thank, we thank Rabbi Shemi, who's in Argentina right now with his own congregation. It was a wonderful message for us. Very encouraging. Um, and we need to remember that because there are days that, that can be very discouraging or moments that we go through where we can't see where we're going. Like Abram, he didn't know where he was going. And I've been through that many times in my life. So this one is the next stage. And I'm almost at the age that Abram was when he was told left So I think uh, Sarah is on a new adventure. She's learning something new, new work. Many of us have new adventures that we have to face in these coming days. Soon we'll be facing the winter. Mauricio, you're facing a hot summer, no? Yes. Uh, right now it's very nice weather. Uh, here is about 24 degrees, so it's good. That's good. Not but we're so coming hot. there soon. We'll all be there in a few minutes. Yes. All your birds, they sound like they're females. They make a lot of noise. <laughs> yeah, they like to talk. <laughs> uh, here. Here it is. <laughs> Yeah, uh, three of them, yes. Wow. Sarai, you're still in Monterrey? Tres in, in Monterrey? Si. Si, si, Peggy. Shalom. Shalom. She's, she's, learning, she's learning podiatry now, I think. No? Si? Uh. I don't know how to say that in Spanish. <laughs> From her sister. Holly, how is everything out west? Good. Good to see. Um, you. See, is that right? No, ten, ten, di, Peggy, disculpa me. No, no. Ayúdame, Mauricio. A ver, a ver, dime. ¿Y qué es lo que dijo Peggy? Oh, perdón, lo que pasa es que estaba escuchando otras cosas. Can you repeat what you say to to ahí? She is learning something new, a new career from her sister right now. Ah, sí, estás aprendiendo una nueva carrera de tu hermana. Eh, eh, sí, me está enseñando a algunas cosas. A ver, este, cómo me va. Sí, yes, yeah, she is learning right now. Yes. Uh, and, and, and she will see how it works. How it goes. This is a new, a new step for her. Yes. And yeah. Sí. I would like to just put in, um, a quick prayer request for John that's not doing well. Oh, so. yeah, your mom's doing well still. Wow, okay. Anybody else need anything we need to pray for? There's a lot of prayer requests. So Karen, Karen I didn't hear. Who's not doing well? John. Who? John. John, John. okay. Sorry. Yeah. Brother. And also um, a really good friend, I'd almost call her my best friend in uh, Mississippi. She got hit by that um, hurricane and they have six kids and they have no power right now until further notice because their company, uh, the supplier is even um, got a tornado there too. So uh, their property was destroyed. They, they're all safe, but they do have a lot of damage including to their house and everything. So. Just keep them in prayer. They're using their pool water and they're cooking outside and six kids and a whole bunch of 10 puppies were just born and one died. And it was just a really hard, really hard few days. And I think just pray for them. Wow. They appreciate that, I'm sure. What are, what are their names? Jerusha. 
Well, the Goss family, G-O-S-S -S family, Goss family. A lot of people got hit with that one. Wow. Yeah, we don't think of these things. We're so blessed. Avinu Shabbat Shemaim, you've heard these requests, Lord, for prayer, and sometimes there are other things that we can't say out loud or things that we, we need to know that you're walking with us, that you're present with us through everything that we go through. Abraham went from experience to experience, and so do we in this life. So, Lord, we ask that you would heal John, heart, soul, and body. And for the Goss family, Lord, that you would take care of their every need and help them in ways that they could never imagine. Lord, we pray for all our families in this community. Help Sarai in her new, in new career. Help us all. And you, you meet us everywhere we are. And we thank you for this. We thank you for another Shabbat. We're still here, Lord. <laughs> we're still walking. Sometimes we're walking blind, but we're walking with you. And we thank you for everything that you're doing. Shabbat shalom, everybody. Shabbat shalom. God, God bless you. Have a good week. Nice to see you all. Thank you, Dudu. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.